Hey, my name is Harold McCarthy. I live at 3791 Wakawachi Drive in Merle's Inlet. I was born in Fort Scott, Kansas, and I moved east when I was about four years old. My grandfather was a custodian in a national cemetery in Springfield, Missouri, and then he sent him to Philadelphia, and we all lived in one big family back then, the uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters. So I lived in a national cemetery for years, from when I was four years old. Then, then we moved out of there into a, a row house in Philadelphia. We lived in row houses, and I remember being out in the street in front of one of the row houses, and I remember people hollering and yelling, and that's when I found out about it. Well, I was 17 years old, and my brother and sister both enlisted. My brother was in the Army, and my sister was in the Marines. So I figured I should go in too. I, didn't, I wasn't crazy about school. But I had to get my parents to sign for me to go in because I was only 17. They wouldn't sign, so I ran away from home for three days and they, they signed it. So I went to uh, Bainbridge, Maryland from Philadelphia to boot camp. It was, uh, it was like 60 miles from home. And I was there in November for Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, and I couldn't go home. They wouldn't let me out. 60 miles away, that, that soured me a little bit right off the bat. Then I uh, was in boot camp 90 days, three months, and they sent me to Gulfport, Mississippi, to what they call a basic engineering school, because I wanted to be a mechanic. That's what I ended up being. And I was there like three months. Then they gave me 10 days to get to San Francisco, so I went by way of Philadelphia and and then went on out to San Francisco, right, a place called Treasure Island, where they shipped everybody out from. So I was there a few days, and they put me on a big transport. The Admiral Coombs was the name of it. And uh, I sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge. I remember it was getting dark, and I watched till I couldn't see any more lights. And uh, we went from there to Pearl Harbor. And, uh, it was a mess because uh, most of everybody got seasick, and there was 5,000 men on this troop ship. I mean, there wasn't much room. So uh, people would run to try to make the latrine to throw up, and they wouldn't make it, and it was, the floor was actually slippery. <laughs> it was a mess. And they, they had salt water for showers. I don't know if you ever tried try to take a shower in salt water. And uh, you felt worse after you showered than you did before. So I went from Pearl Harbor, uh, and I, I got another, sh uh, another smaller troop ship there and went to a little island, Kwajalein, in the Pacific, and, and I got on the Essex there. And then that was a great ship, because uh, like battleships and everything, they're, they're all formal. And most big carriers are too. But I never had my dress blues on once. We never, we'd stand, uh, Watch every morning, but we, we had regular work clothes on. I never had my uniform on, so I, I like that. And there was always something going on. If you weren't on duty, you could. They're always landing and taking off planes, and they always have accidents. The plane will land, and the hook will miss the cable, and it'll go up into the bars. We were. I was in Task Force 48, and. Uh, it was a, we had a, a few English carriers with us, and, and their planes were getting low on gas, a couple of them. They had to land on our carrier. They, they were what they call sea fires. You heard of Spitfires. These were planes made to land on carriers. When they came down, they pulled the hook right out of the back of the plane, and then the plane went up into the barrier. They had this barrier that went up when planes were landing, and the propeller hit, and it, it was wooden, the wooden propeller, and it, all this. Wood flew, so they weren't. Really, our, our resting gear was too thick, too heavy for their, those light planes. And a lot of times, the landing gear would break, and the and the plane would go down and hit the flight deck, slide up into the barrier. So it was it was, it was interesting. Well, it was the first uh, Essex class. They made like ten more after that, the Enterprise and the Ticonderoga. And, uh, it was almost 900 feet long, carried almost 3,000 crew, and it would 
go 38 knots, which is over 40 mile an hour. And that's moving for a big ship like that. And we're, they were signing the surrender when we, we were heading back from Pacific. And uh, we made it in 13 days from Japan to Seattle. And it was like a record at the time. And we towed this big banner behind us. They had helium balloons. Like it must have been a mile long up in the air. A victory. There's something they call them. So I was glad to see that in Seattle. As we went uh, 78 days one time without seeing land. That was a record at the time, too, in the Pacific. So my job was in the engine room. Every hour I'd walk around and they had these transmissions about the size of this room and all these thermometers sticking out of them. And I'd go around and check all those, write them all down. If one was getting hot, it means you had a bearing on or something, but we never had any trouble with it. But. And it was hot down there when you're in the South Pacific. It was like 140 in the, in the fire room, but I was in the engine room, it was like 120. But you couldn't touch the rails. You had to keep your sleeves rolled down. It was red hot. And where the water would in, water intake for cooling the condensers it had a thermometer on. You could always tell we were going north to south because the water would be getting colder. And if you're going, I mean, if you're going north, the water would be getting colder. If you're going south, it would be getting warmer. I was always glad to see it going north because I used to get that prickly heat. And uh, you take a shower and you, you feel good, and boy, about 15 minutes later, you felt worse than you did before. Well, we had a soda fountain. Uh, you had to buy a gallon of soda or a gallon of ice cream, but you'd split it up with your buddies. We had a barber shop, a laundry. I mean, I didn't have to dig any foxholes. It was, you know, you always had clean clothes on, a nice clean place to sleep. We had these little canvas bunks, no springs or anything. And uh, there was four on top of each other. And I had this big, big guy from uh, Akron, Ohio. He was a buddy of mine, but he was heavy. but. He get in that bunk, and I could lay on my back like this, and I touched the bottom of his bunk. That's that's how much room we had. We were uh, off the coast of Japan. Well, before that, we we went to the Philippine Gulf and anchored, anchored there for a week. And every couple of days, they sent us ashore on a little landing craft, and we'd have a peanut butter sandwich and two beers, and uh, had all these Filipinos. They were on the other side of the fence, but trying to sell your stuff, even tried to sell our sisters. But uh, we had our two cans of beer and peanut butter sandwich. And I, I always remember we were anchored. And uh, there was two P-38s flying. I guess they were, they were hot rods. But one of them was too low, and he, and he hit a carrier while I was watching him. And that, you know, that was the end of him. I guess they call them, I don't know what you call them, but hot rodders. Yeah, we were always in a task force, like four or five carriers. That was the number one target for the planes, because if they took out a carrier, they took out a hundred and some airplanes. So that was the number one target. We were only hit one time. You got that picture of it there. We, we had uh, our ship's batteries shot down 33 Jap airplanes, which was a record. Our plane shot down 1,500. Jap planes, and we sunk a record number, uh, tonnage too for ships. But you never hear about the Essex. It's the fighting lady, this and that. The, the, the Essex had a better record than any of them. It was out there longer too. We had radar back then. They, they'd pick up a, a plane at 50 miles, 50 miles away. They call it a bogey on the radar. And uh, we'd send planes out to meet it, and uh, sometimes they'd, they'd uh, shoot it down before it got those, and sometimes it didn't. So we had five-inch anti-aircraft guns. When they were going off, the plane was still quite a ways off. Then we had 20-millimeter aircraft guns. When they were, you could hear them firing from the engine room, and uh, it was getting pretty close then. Then when they had the 50 caliber going off, they, they were right on top of you. So uh, they'd announce everything over a PA system, what's going on, you know. But uh, we had these big fans that suck fresh air down into the engine room, the fire room. And 
when they'd start firing those five-inch guns, they'd have all the smoke and soot and stuff, and they, it would suck it right down. So they'd have to shut the fans off, and then, boy, you'd, you'd get hot. And then uh, they'd shoot some planes down and the others, and they'd take all, I'd start all over again. Uh, we, we bombed, too. We were bombing Japan, northern Honshu, all their coal mines. We, we were bombing that towards the end of the war. A year and a half, I guess. It's, oh, when I did come back, they uh, gave the crew 30 days leave, but they split up in two crews. And I was young, and all these other guys had been out there for a couple of years, so they went home first, which, which I can understand. Then I, I went home for 30 days. Then I come back, and I was chipping paint for about six months, decommissioning the ship. And they recommissioned it for uh, Korea after that. But uh, I chipped paint for about six months painted, and they put these cocoons over the guns. But it went back out again for Korea. But I, I had three kids by then, so I didn't have to worry about going in. I've, ne I've never been in a draft board, because I enlisted before I turned 18. And when I come out, they said, uh, yeah, I shouldn't tell you this, report to a draft board within two, uh, draft board within two weeks. I never went. I went to where it was, and they had moved it. So I said, the heck with it. They wouldn't take them anyway with those three kids, but I've never been in a draft board. I was on the way home when they were signing, the Japanese were signing the surrender. I felt good. I was going home. Didn't have to worry about the Japs shooting at us. Saved a lot of lives, theirs and ours. I know it was a terrible thing, but uh, it did save a lot of lives. But it hurt, hurt a lot of people too. But well, we went to the F uh, Philippine Gulf, like I said, and then then we were off uh, Okinawa and uh, a lot of islands, uh, sending out planes. We had torpedo planes. We dropped torpedoes, and we could carry we carry bombs too. We, we 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 didn't have jets. We had the old propeller-driven planes. We had the Corvair, the, the inverted gull wing. And we had the SP-2C Hell Divers, which is the dive bombers. They had two men in those. And uh, I didn't tell you this, but uh, one of them came back all shot up. And, and he landed. And the, the, the pilot in the back was de dead. And we had like 75 planes up near away running low on fuel to land. So they just pushed it overboard. I think they dive right in it. Uh, oh. And they land these things at night. You can't have any lights on during war. You gotta be pitch black, which is all right for the ship going along. You're not gonna run anything out in the ocean, but those planes that'll land. And the, the flag man had like ping pong paddles and they had lights on them. But can you imagine trying to land a plane? It's like a poster stamp down there. That one guy hit the superstructure one time. He, he didn't make it, but... Uh, Dark as can be, and all he got is these little lights on these paddles, and the guy's going like this, and then he goes like this, and they cut the engine and slam down. But boy, that, uh, that was scary, I bet, landing those things. I signed up for my 5220. I don't know if you know what that is. They gave you, all servicemen, they gave him $20 a week for 52 weeks, or until you found a job. That's what they call a 5220 club. And then my brother-in-law worked, he was in the Marines too, that's where my sister met him. He worked at this uh, Army installation in Bell Mead, New Jersey, where they stored all these generators and, and trucks and stuff and crates. I was an inspector, we'd go around and they all had these little compartment doors on them. We'd take the door off and see if it was getting rusty. Or, but uh, I did that for a while. And uh, I was living in Somerville, which is near where that place was. But, then my family moved to Rumson, New Jersey, so I, I quit the government job and went to work in Buick, Buick dealerships. And then eventually I built my own place in 1962. I bought two acres on a highway in Colts Neck, New Jersey, and had a building put up and uh, had my own place for 23 years. And then uh, they were having this uh, New Jersey and Oregon, the only two, uh, or California, 
that had this phase two vapor recovery. Let's see. So you had to put all different tanks, different pumps, new plumbing. The, the hose for the gas was about this big around, and the gas went in the middle, and, and the air went back into the tank. The, the vapor went back into the tank. So it, it cost a hundred some thousand dollars to do that. So I, didn't, I had to borrow money, so I said the heck with it. So I sold it to a friend of mine, 1985, and uh, I said, if you get stuck for help, I'll, I'll give you a hand. Well, I gave him a hand for 11 years till 1966. <laughs> so I'd spend the winters in Florida, but I'd, I'd work for him in the summer, like 12 hours a day. Well, I had three children by the time I was 23. I got married when I was 20. I had to get my parents' consent for that, too. I had to say, my first child was, uh, say, first child comes any time, the rest of them take nine months. Well, that one came in six months, which was bad back in those days, because my ex-wife lived on a farm, and that, that made it even worse. And they were strict about that, but I was married like 19 years, and I, uh, I raced cars for 16 years. I built stock cars. I was track champion twice, 1950 and 1965. And uh, I was either working on the race car or racing. I was never home. And uh, we'd go out carousing after we got through working. And it was a bad situation. But uh, it was my own fault, really. But anyway, I ended up getting divorced. And I was divorced for like 12 years. And I met my wife now, which is a really nice lady. My daughter says it's the best thing ever happened to me. Because uh, she wouldn't last two weeks the way, the way I was with my first wife. But we're on good terms, I'm glad of that. When I go to New Jersey to visit, we go out to eat. And she's been engaged for like 10 years now. She never got remarried. So I, I'm thankful for that, we're on good terms. In fact, I was paying in support and alimony for years, and then my kids got over 18, so I, I was just paying alimony. And I, I complained to my ex-wife, and I said, I'm getting tired of paying this alimony. She wrote the judge a letter and, and, and uh, released me from it. Now, how many women would do that? No, I modified these old coupes, like 35 Chevy Coupe with a souped-up engine and a, and a fuel injected Pontiac. I, I ran Pontiac most of the time. Well, I started out with flathead Fords. The overheads weren't out yet in 1950. They didn't come out until like 54. So then uh, they only had three mains in old flathead Fords. You'd blow in the engines all the time. You'd drop the pan and it'd be full of a crankshaft. But then I switched to Pontiac, and I was having trouble home, trouble home and stuff, so I, after 16 years, I, I said the heck with it. I usually built my own car, but once in a while I drove for other people, but I ended up having to work on it, otherwise I, I didn't have confidence that the car was safe. Or, so I always did better when I worked on a car, so I used to have to drive to Staten Island, wherever the owner of the car was, and uh, I, just, I spent a lot of time, I was, I was never home all it seemed like. I was either traveling or working on it. But when I built my own in 65, there was a guy down there. My sponsor had a, a bar, and he supplied all the money. So, uh, and I, I built the car. I built the trailer I towed the car on. And uh, he, I'd get in line to get the payoff. It was like $400 to win the feature back then. And I'd get my $400, and I'd take 200 and give it to him. He put it in the bank, which we both uh, had, had the bank account, so half of that money was mine. It was a good deal. I couldn't go wrong. And I say he was happy. We got the track championship and everything. Yeah, I was in the hospital three days one time. And I wrecked. I, didn't, I went for years without turning over. And we're waiting out on the racetrack there to start the race, and I'm talking to the guy next to me. I said, yeah, I, I never flipped yet. Well, I, I flipped in that race. He, it's the same guy, Parker Bone. His son is a bowler, a professional bowler, if you ever heard of Bone. But uh, he said, I'm the only guy that went past him upside down. <laughs> My brother-in-law was from, uh, Con uh, what's the capital? South Carolina. Columbia. Columbia. He was from Columbia, and he met my sister, like I say, when they were in the Marines. And he, 
my family had moved to New Hampshire. And uh, he wanted to be closer to home, so, and he, wanted, he was thinking of retiring, so he, he built a house in uh, Merle's Inlet here, Mount Gilead. He never lived to enjoy it, and he died with lung cancer before he got a chance to move into the house. So my sister has been li living there since. <clears throat> She's got the house up for sale right now because she doesn't need that big house and worry about the lawn being mowed and all that stuff. So she's got it up for sale and she's renting a place. So she's, you know, she's getting up in years like me. Well, she's five years older than I am, so and I'm 82. My father and mother had bought a place. Well, they had a, tra a trailer in Mount Gilead, not Mount Gilead, Green Acres Mobile Home Park, which is, and they used to come down in the wintertime. So then my father and mother bought one. So then my father died. So my mother uh, gave the house to my sister and, and she moved down here permanent. And she died in uh, 94. She was 96 when she died and healthy. She had all her teeth. Because I've got the same dentist and I, I'm missing two teeth. But she had all her teeth in 96. Well, I was spending the winters down here. After, I had the house built in, in uh, 93. And uh, we were coming down here for the winters. Uh, but then I. The guy that I was sold the station to, he sold it, and I wasn't going to work for someone else because I had all my own customers. And uh, so I said, it's time to leave, so, so I quit. That was in 66, I moved here permanent. I said, I was glad I, was, I couldn't have picked a better ship to be on. You never got bored, there was always something to do. And it wasn't, didn't have to wear a uniform and all that stuff every, every morning. When you had ro roll call, they called it. Yeah, we had those uh, old propeller-driven planes. They didn't shoot them off with a uh, catapult like they do now. They used to take off. And they'd take off, and you'd see them go down like this, and then they'd go up. And every now and then they go down like this, keep going down and kerplunk in the ocean. So they'd pick them up with a destroyer. You couldn't stop a carrier. When I heard him say that, Japanese were signing the surrender when I was on the way home. Well, the best thing is when I got discharged. That was even better when I was heading home. Oh, yeah. I enlisted in Philadelphia. So if you could show that you had a job in Seattle, they'd pay you so much a mile. I got $700 payment to go to, like, to Philadelphia. So I went to a hotel and then the guy wrote a note saying that he was going to give me a job as a bellhop. So, <laughs> so I got my $700 and, and caught a train home. Oh no, I hitchhiked. Me and another guy in Philadelphia hitchhiked home. Uh, day and night, except this one couple picked us up in Montana. They were on their second honeymoon and uh, they stopped in a hotel and they, we didn't want to bother. They said, well, you, why don't you stop too? So we stopped in the motel too. And we, we were with them two days. I, I drove every now and then, so that was interesting. <laughs>